Hi there, thanks a lot for joining this latest um, installment of the On Philosophy Lecture Series. It's been running weekly with occasional twice weekly and once five times in a week since the early um, well, early September. Um, we're coming into the last month or so. Um, it's a series that's organised by a long running public philosophy journal based in the UK. It's called The Philosopher. This is the latest issue of The Philosopher featuring, amongst other things, um, the CUNY Graduate Centre philosopher Serene Kader writing on um, feminism and relational autonomy. It looks at a lot of other questions around the formation of collectivities as well as lots of other things. So um, we run these events for free. Um, any donations to help our costs will be um, very much appreciated. I'll put some links about the philosopher in the chat function as we go through. So to come to the event um, that's happening today, it's happening in the evening for me and Catherine. It's happening in the morning for Kate Ritchie over in California. And I dare say for the rest of you out there, it could be any combination of morning, evening and afternoon. So I'm really excited to have Catherine and Kate in conversation. The title is um, The Ontology of Gender. So obviously, um, as many people know, gender is a hot topic, um, a controversial topic. It's also one of the most philosophically interesting topics, I'd say, um, in terms of world influence. It's one of the areas where philosophers can stake more claim than they can in a lot of Fields. I mean, partly due to thinkers like Judith Butler, more recently Sally Haslanger. So um, Kate and Catherine are going to consider it from the point of view of ontology, which is their respective areas of specialization. So thinking about, you know, ontology is the study of what there fundamentally is in the world. Um, the question that they're going to ultimately be helping us with is what is it to have a gender. So just to introduce Catherine and Kate, both of them have actually moved to university over the summer. Catherine from Nottingham University to Glasgow University, where she's a lecturer in philosophy. She um, researches primarily in social philosophy, especially the ontology of social categories. She's interested in how social categories like races and genders exist and how these categories are bound up with systematic injustices. Um, Kate Ritchie, who's moved from um, the City University of New York Graduate Center over to University of California, Irvine, um, is also um, a social ontologist. Her research lies at the intersection of inquiry on language and the social wor world, a focus on the nature of social groups and the interface between semantics and ontology. So um, really delighted to have these two in conversation. Obviously, one of the advantages of these digital events is um, I don't know how many thousands of miles between Catherine and Kate, but anyway, they can be in conversation for this event. Um, their conversation will start very shortly. It'll probably last about half an hour. Um, please feel free to send questions through any time to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Any comments you want to post during the thing, just um, send it to the chat function. I'll also be updating the chat function with links to Kate and Catherine's websites, their work, various other relevant things. And if Kate and Catherine bring up any books or theorists, I'll try and look them up and post them there. So I think that's probably everything I need to say. So hopefully Kate and Catherine will come on the screen shortly and I will drift into the background and um, I really hope you all enjoy the event. Oh, thanks for that lovely introduction, Anthony. Hi, Kate. Hey, Catherine. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. That was um, very nice, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, why don't we get started? So I wanted to start off by asking you if you could uh, sort of set the stage by telling us a little bit about what philosophers mean when they say ontology, sort of generally, not yet specifically focused on gender. Yeah, so in general, um, I think that in a very basic sense, ontology is pretty much the study of stuff. It's stuff and things. Um, so what things are there in the world and how do they exist? How do they, how do they get to be there? How do they stay there? So it's a branch within metaphysics kind of broadly conceived. And then ontology is kind of more narrowly within that um, the study of things like objects or entities and, and their, how they exist. 
So one important idea in ontology that I think we're going to talk about a bit later um, as, the, as the talk goes on is the idea of kinds, which I think has a slightly technical sense in this context, because it's about kinds are kind of like groupings of things in the world that can help us explain and predict the world. So uh, chemical elements would be a really good example of kinds because they're kind of groupings of substances and they help chemists um, predict how different substances are going to react under different kinds of conditions. So to bring it round to gender briefly, um, the ontology of gender is just asking these questions about gender, right? Are there gender kinds in the world? If so, um, what kinds of sorts of things are they? How do they exist and how do they help us to explain things? Um, so I think we wanted maybe to talk a little bit more about this idea of of kinds and, and some people draw a distinction between what get called natural kinds and what get called social kinds. So do you want to talk a little bit about that contrast? Do you think there is a contrast and, and how would you characterize it, Kate? Yeah, great. So I do think there is a contrast between um, natural kinds, if we're thinking of those as paradigmatically like chemical kinds and social kinds like lawyers or genders or money. Um, but I don't, so I want to, yeah, I guess I can say a little bit about ways I think they're not different and then ways I think they, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that they are different. So I think they're not different in that they're completely separate, um, sorts of things. So we would need a separate sort of ontological category for social kinds and natural kinds. So you might think, um, like events, you might think if you think about things that happen, like those seem sort of different than objects like cups or tables. So you might think those are just very, very different, different ontological categories maybe. Um, and I don't think social and natural kinds are like that. I think they're you know, in the same in the same ontological category. And I think we maybe agree on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so uh, that's one way in which I think um, they're similar. I also think as you were saying that they can both figure in explanations that, um, that both sorts of kinds exist. I believe in chemical kinds. I also believe in social kinds, mm. but that's that they're completely the same. So I think that the, the way I think of social kinds is as being dependent on social structures where we can think of social structures as sort of broad systematic patterns that depend on our behavior and what we believe and the ways we interact. They might depend on explicit things that we, we code up in laws. Um, so like to become a lawyer, you need in the US to have a JD. Um, I imagine there's a very similar <laughs> degree and maybe it's a JD in the UK as well. Um, uh, right, so you need to have a particular degree. This grants, like once you have this degree, you have particular rights and obligations. So that, those might be um, partially definitive of what it is to be a lawyer, but those depend on you know things that we put in place. Whereas yeah. with natural kinds, you might think they also depend on real sort of patterns out in the world, but ones that um, that don't depend on sort of what we believe, what we've coded up, the ways in which we're interacting. Um, yeah, what about you? What do you think about yeah. the difference between natural and social kinds? Yeah, I would very strongly agree with that, both in terms of them being similar and being different. I think something that's interesting to know, to think about social kinds is that the fact that they are, as you say, kind of up to us in a different kind of way, um, doesn't mean that we're always going to know a lot about them in advance. So it might be that we set up the world in ways that produce certain kinds that, that are explanatory kind of categories in that sense, but that then we don't know we did that and then we can come along and find them. So someone might discover that like recessions might be a good example of this. So it might be that no one kind of sets out to like make recessions sessions be a category like we sort of set out to kind of make certain you know make people into lawyers but nevertheless the things we do give rise to recessions and then that's a useful kind for social scientists and we might find that out so the way in which social kinds are as you as you you say and I agree kind of up to us there's quite a lot of layers to that and they, they can still come as a surprise to us I think even though you know we originate them in that sense I don't know if you do yeah I agree oh uh, yeah no I totally agree um yeah I think that the, and this, this is something that's come out um, really strongly in work uh, by feminist philosophers, feminist theorists, critical race theorists, sort of thinking that um, it might be very hard to see potentially that some of these categories depend on us in various sorts of ways. And that's something, right, so that, um, that gender categories aren't just these sort of natural categories that divide people up in particular ways is something that can take some work to actually see. So I think right, that category mm -hmm. depends on us. Does it mean, yeah, it's completely um, transparent to us that it depends on us? I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, 
Um, right. So let's see. So I, I'll ask the next next question. Um, right. So it sounds like we both think there are social kinds, there are natural kinds. Um, I also take it we both think there are lots of different social kinds. So there, mm. there are racial kinds, gender kinds, mm -hmm. kinds like money, occupational categories, and then also these sorts of intersectional kinds. So we might think that um, that um, Black women, say, forms uh, another kind that's not sort of decomposable just into a racialized kind being Black or Black people and um, a gender kind, like women. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about um, how similar or different you think these different sorts of kinds are. Yeah, this is, this is, I think, where we start to um, get into territory where I think there's, like, philosophers have, like, really a lot of, of very different views um, on it. So you mentioned race and gender. And I think some philosophers think we can tell a quite a similar story about these kinds. So Auster, for example, in a recent book, thinks that both race and gender are kind of well understood as sort of something like a social status. We kind of get to count a certain way and to have a certain kind of social meaning or social status um, because of all the ways in which other people respond to us, both kind of formally and officially, but also in more kind of informal um, and unofficial, sometimes very subtle ways. Just, you know, the fact that you're expected to make the coffee round here when it's the coffee break might be part of what makes you what it is to have the social status woman in a particular context, right? So it seems like she wants to tell a, a similar kind of like the, the metaphysics is very similar between those stories, although the details are going to differ. And um, so I think, you know, some people want to treat it more like that. But then there's a lot of work that about race kinds or gender kinds that doesn't then transfer over. So and a good example of this, I think, might be Chike Jeff has, has really interesting work. Um, he argues that race kinds are kind of constructed through shared cultures, shared ways of life and um, shared kind of aims and values. And that story doesn't seem like it's gonna transfer very well, at least across to gender, or at least it would, would look hard, be hard to say that it was kind of closely analogous, I think. So the takeaway story from this is that people do try to tell kind of general stories about social kinds that, that work across the board for different sorts of kinds, um, but not everyone's gonna agree that that's a good way to go. And then you mentioned this really, um, it's important concept of intersectionality, which of course is the idea that, you know, it's kind of open to question really whether race and gender can even be thought of as separate kinds um, anyway, right? So they're always intermeshed in our experiences and where does that leave us metaphysically? So work by black feminist philosophers and women of color philosophers has been really kind of significant here. So Kimberle Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, Maria Lugones would be some kind of big figures. And um, where all of this leaves me on that is I'm kind of a pluralist. I think that there are lots of race kinds, like race isn't one thing. And I think the same for gender, gender isn't one thing. I think there are some similarities on a broad brushstrokes level as to how those kinds exist. Um, but the detail is gonna be very different. In terms of intersectionality, I'm inclined to think of intersectionality in terms of like a level of um, kind of granularity, like how zoomed in or how zoomed out, how broad brushstrokes do you want to tell us tell a story about categories or how kind of much do you want to zoom in on the particularity? And whatever you say, it's the particularity of everyone's intersectional experiences that ultimately is going to make that true. But for certain explanatory purposes, telling a story in, in a more broad terms might, might work well. But I think the lesson we take from, you know, work on this um, that I mentioned is that we should be really careful about going too broad. It's really easy to miss a lot of the specificity of people's lives by, by doing it that way. So that's what I'd say about race and gender and intersectionality. I don't know if you want to either, you know, chime in on that or maybe say something about some other kinds of distinctions that we can encounter here between different sorts of kinds. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what, um, a lot of what you're saying about um, race and gender and and intersectionality and sort of ways these, um, yeah, ways these might differ and ways they might sort of have some similarities as well. Yeah, so I think, um, so I've been kind of think of social kinds or social categories um, in a sort of, in a, in a sort of broad framework, I guess, that involves mm. sort of thinking of different sorts of structural relations, um, but those structural relations um, could um, could come in lots of different flavors. So they might be more normative, more historical, they might involve more self-identification or less self-identification. So I think in this sort of framework, if you're thinking, well, um, right, we have lots of different relations between people and there might be sort of nexuses or positions that sort of come out um, for particular explanatory purposes where people are gonna be positioned in particular ways. Mm -hmm. um, that allows for a lot of sort of flexibility while using this sort of unified framework. 
Um, and yeah, thinking about some other sort of um, other sorts of distinctions that might be useful here. So I think one distinction um, that um, social ontologists have thought about a decent amount is the distinction between causal and constitutive mm -hmm. dependence or sometimes what's called causal and constitutive social construction. So right, so the causal, causal social construction would be something like um, some sorts of social factors like the ways in which um, the ways in which we behave or think things that people are doing um, cause something to come into existence. Yeah. So you might think about plastics as being like that. Plastics are a social kind in a certain sense in that they're caused by us. Like we we humans have, um, for better or worse, uh, maybe for worse in lots of ways, um, you know, made these things. Um, and then there are other sorts of uh, social categories or social kinds that seem to be dependent on us in ways that aren't purely causal. Maybe there's, maybe causation is part of the story, but you might think, Without humans, the, like if, if all humans died off, there would still be plastic around, but maybe there wouldn't be money. There might still be, you know, bits of metal or pieces of paper, but it seems like money kind of depends on, yeah, how we're how we're interacting with it. It seems to sort of depend on our practices, maybe a status we've conferred on it, um, maybe um, maybe something else, but it seems to be much more dependent on um, our sort of practices or thoughts or beliefs. Um, so that would be a sort of more constitutive view. Um, another thing we might think about is that sort of points to another difference between sorts of social kinds is um, what Ian Hacking has called looping effects. Mm -hmm. So certain sorts of social kinds seem to be such that when a person is categorized, that can change the way they behave, that can change the way they conceptualize themselves, and that might actually end up changing the kind itself too, as you sort of have these loops sort of come yeah, around. Play up to the social kinds that we're kind of, the way we're labeled, we then kind of play up to those labels and kind of it comes out through how we live and, and shapes us. Yeah. Being categorized, right? Exactly. Um, but that seems like it's possible for maybe race and gender, but not possible for money because bits of paper or what, you know, codes right. a, or something don't represent person. themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So those are like some differences and we already mentioned kind of opaque and transparent social kinds, the ones where you know it's social, the ones where that might take you by surprise or you might not, not know it exists. Um, so those those are some, some important distinctions. Another important distinction, I guess, is the difference between how we might talk about these things and how the things kind of in the world actually are, right? So when we're thinking about gender or other social kinds, can you say a bit about the relationship between the language and, and the world in this sense? Yeah, right. So I think this is um, a super interesting sort of area. Um, so one thing to, um, right, so, so there's there's sort of broad distinction that goes outside social ontology between um, representation and reality. So we can talk of things in particular ways. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way things actually are. Um, mm -hmm. There can be things that exist for which we have no words. Um, we can have words for things that don't actually exist. So maybe ghosts don't exist, or we can be you know, seeking the fountain of youth. That doesn't mean the fountain of youth actually exists. Um, so I think, right, so we have this sort of distinction and it gets, things get sort of more complicated and I think more interesting um, once you get in the social realm, because right. thinking back to um, looping effects that, that I just mentioned, right, there's this kind of way in which language and reality might, um, might combine in some interesting and complicated sorts of ways. So one, one thing that I thought about a little bit lately um, is labels and mm -hmm. the ways in which um, we might have, we might have labels for certain social kinds and we might not have labels for others. So this relates to um, the concept of hermeneutical injustice, which is something that Miranda Fricker has discussed. But um, so there was a time at which we didn't have a label for sexual harassment, but nevertheless, it seems very likely, that, you know, not just very likely, it, sexual harassment did exist prior to us having the label for it. It was a thing. It certainly was a thing. So it can't be the case that all social things are things for which we have labels. Um, and it can also be sort of interesting if we think through um, think through what, what, um, what categories or what phenomena we don't have labels for. So I think sexual harassment is one. It's like, why wasn't there a label for it? Um, maybe lots of reasons, but it also sort of allowed it to stay under the surface, right? It allowed it to not for um, 
people who are being sexually harassed and not be able to come together so easily with this shared terminology. Um, and I think that's something we see now with different sorts of categories for people as well, um, mm -hmm. like being cisgender or even the degree to which being white or whiteness is brought up as an explanation in a lot of areas. I think often other racial racial identities are brought up as being more explanatory than whiteness or more or being gay is brought up as being more explanatory than um, being heterosexual or being straight. Um, so I think this again can sort of mask dominance um, in various domains by um, by either not having expressions at all for something in language or by using them very rarely. Right. So it's interesting that you say that because one thing I know we wanted to cover a little bit is this is what gets called um, conceptual engineering or ameliorative projects. It's a kind of fancy sounding words, but they, they're really just talking about what we might as philosophers want to do, I guess, in response to some of the things that you just described, Kate. So the idea that there might be a concept missing that we need to describe the world or concepts that are kind of tricksy or funny or like put us in the point us in the wrong direction or, or aren't really kind of what we need. So I guess the general idea, I'd be interested to know how you think about this, but I, for me, the general idea, I guess, is that the terms that we use and the concepts that we use to, to think and communicate with each other um, direct our attention towards the world in certain ways. So once we have a term for sexual harassment, maybe we're going to start to notice it more or something like that. Um, so then the idea with conceptual engineering roughly is that we can try and actively and deliberately shape the terms and concepts we use in order to direct our attention to the world in more useful or more you know, better ways that are in some sense better. And then I guess the idea of an ameliorative project, so ameliorative making better or like lessening some kind of problem, that might I guess be a kind of specific type maybe of conceptual engineering where Mm, we're aiming to direct our attention to the world in ways that we think are going to be politically helpful. So in ways that are going to help us advocate for justice, for example. Um, so you might say that making sure that we have terms and concepts for um, genders other than man and woman, things like being genderqueer, for example, that's a kind of, that might be an ameliorative project because having those kind of concepts in our toolbox is going to help us do things that are important for justice. I don't know whether you think about it similarly. Yeah, I, uh, I, de I definitely do. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So I think conceptual engineering is um, a sort of broader term that allows for everything from, you know, refining how we use the word planet. Um, so that's mm. included now because that won't sort of let in a bunch of other um, yeah. distant objects <laughs> um, to, yeah, two more specific, two cases that are more focused on justice, like um, these sort of ameliorative projects. Yeah. Cool. So I think we've covered some kind of general stuff that we wanted to, and I'd really like to now ask you to tell us a little bit more about um, like your particular research and what your, you know, what questions are you most trying to answer in your research in this area at the moment, Kate? Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, let's see. So one project I've been thinking about lately is about our linguistic and mental representational devices. And um, this sort of relates up to conceptual engineer engineering, like how we might sort of more carefully understand those and how that might um, allow us to think through strategies for shifting how we talk and how we think um, that might have some positive um, uh, anti-oppressive sort of out outcomes. So, so thinking about a couple of sort of uh, little, what, what um, semanticists call minimal pairs. So you, a pair of sentences that are just minimally different. So I can say, <laughs> I can say um, Jane is blonde and I could say Jane is a blonde mm. or I can say Sarah is female, Sarah's a female. So mm. they're very minimally different, right? The only thing that's different between them is this little word, yeah, the indefinite determiner, A, but they seem to be more different than that, or they seem to have sort of different effects. You might think yeah. saying, yeah, saying that Sarah's a female is, I don't, categorizing her, maybe it's making you think of some stereotypes. Um, I think with a blonde, some stereotypes come to mind. Um, yeah. And yeah, you might think this is more explanatory about like who this person really is, who Sarah is, mm -hmm. um, how she's gonna act in other circumstances. So mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, so one, um, one aspect of this project is to just try to think more carefully through um, the sort of linguistic and mental representation sides, understand how to get a theory of those um, that captures the difference between these um, nouns. So in, if when we have um, a female, we have now a noun phrase versus adjectives and what might be going on there. And then thinking through how um, 
how it seems like the nouns might draw out um, that a kind is salient rather than just merely a feature, maybe that that kind has an underlying essence, maybe a biological essence, um, that it might be really stable and explanatory. Um, yeah, so I've been thinking through um, what we might do in these sorts of, um, or what we ought to do, I guess, because this is again about sort of these prescriptive projects, this conceptual engineering, how we ought to be changing perhaps how we talk and think. Right, how we want to go forward with that concepts. So, I mean, yeah. is the idea that when we're doing conceptual engineering, we might just want to steer clear of, of noun phrases in the kind of, in, in general, but that's probably too, that's probably too strong, right? Yeah, um, I think it is, although uh, it has been sort of alluded to. So, I mean, I think some people, there are some here, so um, that have said at least that we ought to avoid um, social generics. So things like women are nurturing, um, so it's fine to maybe say birds fly, but we shouldn't be using generics about um, generics about sort of social categories because yeah. they're going to promote essentialism. And sometimes that sort of move those arguments move very close to we should never label like we shouldn't have any nouns for social categories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. A, yeah, I don't think that's the right way to go in part because I think nouns can be really important for understanding for explaining um, self identifying can be really vital right. to a lot of people as well. So yes, yeah, so I think that's too strong. Okay, I, I thought it might be. Um, so, yeah. so, so, the, I guess our theme tonight is is gender, and you mentioned, you know, the difference between saying someone is female versus saying they're a female. I'm doing like, how, where do you think that that leaves us with words like woman and man, where there really isn't an adjective version, or it's a bit further away? Like saying someone is a woman and saying someone is womanly just seem like more more different than the cases you're interested. In, I guess because it seems to me like um, if I so moved by the considerations that you mentioned, you might think, well, don't say it's so-and-so, don't say Catherine is our woman, say Catherine is female, but you might think that in at least some context, those are gonna have different connotations. So using the word female instead of woman might kind of give an impression that you're very focused on kind of biological or bodily criteria for membership, which might not be what you wanna, the impression that you want to give in a particular case. So yeah, where does that leave us with like, is a woman, is a man, those kinds of phrases, do you think? Yeah, great. I think. Yeah, I think this is a, um, the exact sort of right question to push on. So I think mm -hmm. um, rightly that, um, like, as you say, in in English, um, woman doesn't, you can say womanly as the adjective, but that's sort of, I mean, that seems quite different than um, being a woman. Um, yeah, so I think in cases where we don't have, um, so I think in cases where we don't have sort of both options, so it's not grammatical mm -hmm. to say both either the adjectival form or the nominal form, um, that what we should be doing is thinking more carefully about the meaning of the expression. So if we first think about sort of lexical categories like nouns, adjectives, verbs, I think lexical categories can have significant effects on how we represent, um, represent kinds or represent properties or represent events or whatever. Um, so I think that's something we should attend to. So that's sort of why I've been focused on some of these cases where you can get both the adjective and the noun form. But I right. think- So it's a philosophical claim just to say like this matters, like hold up everybody like this, we should be thinking about this, right? That's already a kind of, um, to say something, you know, different. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I think, um, but then, right, so what should, yeah, what should be done in cases where we only have a noun? Should we introduce an adjective? Like that would be one move to sort of come up with a new expression that is an adjective. I think another thing we can do is think about um, some of these distinctions we drew before um, earlier in our discussion between a kind being um, overt or covert, sort of transparent or oh, yeah. opaque in terms of whether it's social. We can think about how biological the term is. So I think often if a term is taken to have a biological connotations or biological meanings that can seem sort of more dehumanizing or sort of outside of the person's autonomy mm -hmm. whereas if if a, if a um if a word is, has a has a more overtly social kind of meaning a meaning that might allow some agency it might allow some self-identification or autonomy to do some work so if you think about like, occupational terms like okay, saying yeah. someone is a doctor or a dentist or a philosopher those are all nouns but they sound much I mean, unless someone really hates philosophers or doctors or something, which none of us do, I'm sure, um, then uh, they don't sound so bad. And I think part of that has to do with the meaning there. So I think both, um, you know, whether it's a noun or adjective can matter, and then sort of more specifics about the category can matter as well.
right so the detail the detail is going to match of the particular cases that makes sense yeah, um, yeah. Um, great. So why don't we uh, turn to your research? So I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, some uh, some of your current projects or sort of what questions you're particularly trying to ask or answer right now. Yeah, sure. So one idea I've been thinking about recently is to do with what happens when social kinds or categories are set up in ways that are unjust and oppressive, where what it is to be made into a member of that kind is going to involve maybe being placed in a subordinated social position or being kind of wrongfully kind of constrained or, or limited in terms of what you can do socially. Um, so a, a really kind of like very strong kind of obvious example here might be something like the think about the category of slave in the context of say kind of the 18th century transatlantic slave trade kind of situation. Think about that historical context and then the, the social kind, the socially constructed category of slave. Um, it, it's clear that that's you know, inherently the product of an unjust system. It's not a kind that could exist in a, in a, in a, not in a system that wasn't a social situation that wasn't like monstrously unjust. Um, but various people have thought that gender or sex, this is not, this distinction isn't, is, sometimes these are kind of treated together, sometimes they're treated separately, but various people have thought that those categories um, work in something like that way. Um, so the French feminist Monique Wittig, for example. So the idea isn't that you're a woman and then you might, you know, encounter some kind of problematic social dynamics, but rather that those, you know, unjust, unfair, um, unequal social dynamics are part of what like kind of characterizes that social role or that social kind. Um, so the thought is not just that being in the category puts you in line for wrongful treatment, in some cases like with slave, like extremely wrongful treatment. It's, it's on top of that, the fact that being put in line for that kind of treatment helps to define what it is to belong to the category or kind in the first place. So you're wronged by the very fact that you've been socially constructed in that way, as well as by all the you know, very materially bad stuff that, that happens to you. So in a society, you know, if you think that um, in at least some context to count as a woman is to kind of count for less socially speaking, then it would follow, I think, that anyone who's made into a woman suffers a particular kind of wrong. Um, I call this, this wrong ontic injustice because it's to do with ontology. Um, but I think people have talked about it under different labels as well. And I guess I'm interested in this idea just in just kind of understanding that phenomenon in general, but especially figuring out how people working on the metaphysics of social kinds on the ontology of kinds like gender should respond to the fact that that type of injustice is a possibility. Um, so that's one question. And then also like, so further downstream, I guess, what, that, what does that mean for our everyday social practices around these kinds of categories that might be unjust in, in the ways I, I just mentioned? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a really um, useful way of conceptualizing things, I think, in terms of ontic injustice. So one thing that came to mind as you were um, discussing this is sort of the wrongs that people might face who are categorized in a particular way. But whether you're th you think so suppose some so, so suppose um, a trans man is categorized as a woman and suppose that uh, I, uh, who self-identify as a woman, am also categorized as a woman. Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, it seems like both of us would be facing a kind of ontic injustice given the way you're understanding these gender categories. Do you think there um, are, is an additional wrong the trans man faces? Is there a different sort of wrong? Can you say if you think these are the same or different? Yeah, so I think that there is a difference. I think they're both ontic injustice, but I think they are slightly different kind of um, subspecies, if you will, of ontic injustice. So I think that there's there's one thing that, it, well, so one thing that can happen is you can have a category where we don't really need to know who you are to know that you'd be wronged if you were constructed that way. So no one should be socially constructed as a slave, for example, that just like should not happen. And we don't need additional information about people's like characteristics in order to know that that's like morally, politically inappropriate, right? right. Um, so, and then other categories, I think it depends, um, it depends on features of you. It's something about you in conjunction with the way the category is makes that like a wrongful category for you. So I don't think it's wrongful that I'm not socially constructed as a parent, for example. Um, I don't have children. I don't have uh, biological children. I don't have adopted children. I'm, I'm, I'm not a parent and that's fine. But somebody who um, is the adopted parent of a child to be constructed as a non-parent, then that would be problematic because of something more specific about them. It's, 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 it doesn't do justice to them. We have to know more about them and their life before we can see that that, that construction is morally inappropriate there. Um, so I think gender is interesting to me partly because I think it's the site of both, or it's a place where both types of ontic injustice happen. So I think that what it is to be constructed as a woman 
is uh, to be it involves being placed in a subordinated social position I think that's wrongful for everyone who gets constructed that way and I think that's probably true of all gender categories maybe other than man and you might even want to specify you know um, more intersectional layers to that but I'll leave that aside for now um but I also think that there's a particular kind of of wrongness in being constructed as a member of a gender that's um, fundamentally at odds with your sense of self or that contradicts your gender identity. So I think that you and I as cis women get constructed as women and we suffer an ontic injustice. I think a, a trans man who was socially constructed as a woman who was kind of placed in the social role of woman contrary to his sense of self and identification would suffer the same ontic injustice as we do because he's still, you know, placed in that category and it's kind of not, you know, comes with some bad stuff or is defined by some bad stuff, but he'd have experienced an additional ontic injustice as well in that it's, it's wrongful to, um, it's at odds with his sense of himself in a way that I speak for you, but it isn't, it isn't in that sense wrongful for me. Right. So it's complicated. Yeah. Um, that's kind of why I find it interesting, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably take some questions, I think. Is that about the right time to be switching over to some... Yeah. Audience participation. Okay. Sure. Well, um, thank you both so much, and especially for the work you put into structuring the discussion. Um, I really appreciate that. As obviously you were both speaking on a level playing field without one of you being the interviewer and the other the interviewee. And sometimes those kind of conversations can be much more difficult to do well. So thank you both so much. So yeah, there are inevitably a lot of questions that have come through. I, I thought I'd just start with one that was emailed to me. Um, in fact, no, it came via Twitter from someone who'd seen the list. So it's from an organization called Everywhere Philosophy based in Vermont, Vermont um, in America, which brings philosophy to children, teens and adults in public and virtual spaces. So the question was, after a brief look at the possibility of non-human persons a few weeks back, we were wondering, can an inorganic being like maybe an AI have a gender? So I'm not sure if one of you wants to jump in on that. Um, I mean, I don't really want to necessarily assign a question. I mean, some some may seem more appealing to one of you than the other. So you go for it, Kate. I think this relates to your view of gender in an interesting way. Um, yeah, I think let's see. So that's a very, uh, very cool question. Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. I. I'm not exactly sure what I think. I think, well, here's, I guess here's what I think. I guess it seems to me that if we had a lot of, if there were AI beings that um, were sort of integrated into our society um, so that they began to be positioned in ways that um, human persons are, then I would be inclined to think that maybe one of those AIs could be a doctor, maybe one of those AIs could be a woman or a man or gender fluid, um, potentially, I guess. It depends on um, maybe self-identification too. Um, but yeah, I guess I think it would require more integration rather than just sort of having a mind. Because I think it would largely depend on how others, um, or at least it would depend in part on how others were um, apt to treat uh, the artificial intelligent being, um, whether others were to take norms to apply to it, maybe mm -hmm. whether it is able to take norms to apply to it itself or herself or himself. Yeah, so people, um, yeah, no, I really agree. Like if people kind of, I don't know, resented being told things by an AI that was gendered female more than they resented being told things by an AI that was like presented as male or had, you know, been constructed with a male sounding voice or something, then I think that would be an interestingly gendered interaction at least. And as that got richer and richer, I might want to say that 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 AI could have a gender. I think this is where I find it really helpful to think about gender in a pluralist way to say that gender isn't one thing, it's many things. So one of the things I think gender is is a sense of self or identity and maybe an AI couldn't have that at least in the ways that we've understood it so far. But something else is more what Kate was talking about being positioned in a kind of network of social relationships that have certain meanings. And there I think, yeah, in the right circumstances, as you say, Kate, I would definitely agree an AI could have a gender in that sense. But that's why I think it's helpful to break gender down a bit. Okay, so there's another question here, which I think would seem naturally to fit in with um, Catherine, she was talking about ameliorative projects. So the question is, how much conceptual revision is too much? Um, when is a revision a complete change of topic? So I guess it's about the limits of um, conceptual engineering or ameliorative analysis. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think it highlights the ways that um, uh, social ontology and you know philosophy of language really kind of interface together very intimately at this point. I'm kind of more of a philosopher, so I guess I don't have a direct answer to the question. I'd be interested to know what what Kate thinks in a second, but. I think in general, what, what I'm most interested in is that we end up um, talking about the things we need to be talking about given our purposes and organizing our social practices in ways that kind of do justice to people's needs. So I'm less interested in figuring out like, what does this word really mean and have we changed the subject? If we sort of set off on a kind of ameliorative project being like, okay, what do we need to be um, talking about in order to kind of get where we need to get and do what we need to do. We might find out more about our needs and about the world on that journey. And we might end up talking about something that we would never at the beginning of the process have said was like the thing that that word meant. But I guess I'm not super worried by that. I see it as quite a kind of politically engaged process. Um, but that's not to say I don't think there's lots that's interesting to say from a philosophy of language point of view about you know where that, where that line comes. I guess I just don't, don't really specifically have a view on that. Um, what do you think, Kate? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I think, I mean, I agree that in thinking about what sort of tools we're here, we're now thinking about like words or sort of representational devices in our minds might be useful. Um, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the interesting work happens there. I mean, I think we can sort of think about lots of ways in which um, words we use now or ways we conceive of things now relate back to earlier. Um, earlier ways people talked and sort of like, so is, for example, the word meat, which now picks out sort of animal flesh that people eat, um, used mm -hmm. to uh, just be mean food. So there's clearly a relation between these. They sound very, they sound quite similar. Um, they're both about things you eat. Like, is that the same word or not? It seems to me like you can kind of set up um, sort of ways of modeling or ways of understanding, some of which involve, yeah, it's the same word that sort of slowly changed and it's the same thing at the end. And then other cases where you might have some sort of indeterminacy in the middle, but you mm -hmm. think you ultimately have a, a distinct word. Um, and I, I'm, yeah, I guess I don't, um, I'm not sure if there's a good reason to go for one view or the other. Um, yes, in terms of individuating words or have we really changed the subject or not? So I think, yeah, how that matters the most now is just, are we able to converse like when, when the three of you know when everyone here uses the word meat it seems like we are kind of on roughly the same page plausibly um are we doing the same thing with um with words like woman or man i think sometimes there is sort of talking past each other and maybe because like catherine was saying those words maybe the right sort of metaphysical picture is that those words can pick out a lot of different kinds of social categories or sorts of social categories yeah and if i could just just add one, one thing onto that i think that I think that regardless of what we end up saying about those questions of, of where to draw in the line linguistically, which I agree is interesting, um, I guess we can still kind of challenge it, um, a, a particular kind of attempt at conceptual engineering can still be challenged in something like that spirit, but without making it about the language necessarily. Someone could say, okay, you've arrived at an answer you think that we should, you know, use this concept and use it this way but like that doesn't meet the needs that were motivating me to try and look into that conceptual project that doesn't explain the thing that I set off wanting to explain we've drifted so there might be a kind of a drift um or getting too far away from where you started in the wrong sort of way that's um a legitimate grounds to kind of take issue with a particular attempt at conceptual engineering I think that can definitely happen I guess it can happen on a language level but I think it can probably happen on a sort of more political than linguistic level as well. And that's like, I think that's a reasonable challenge to make to any particular program. And then you just have to you know, have that out. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Chris Maines, who is doing an event for us next week with Beth Lord um, on Spinoza in relation to the Anthropocene. So Chris asks, where do material and economic power differentials in societies come from in relation to gender as you understand it? For example, what causes some societies to be patriarchal, others matriarchal, others still different from that? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure which of you would like to um, jump in on that one. Uh, Catherine, do you wanna take the first? Oh, let's go. Uh, it's a really good question. I think what it highlights is that the way that I, I like to think about social ontology is as being, you know, it needs a lot of empirical kind of input, right? You need to be kind of in touch with history and sociology and stuff. And, and that can be challenging because that's, you know, a lot of different things to kind of get to grips with. Um, that said, and acknowledging that kind of 
um, overlap. It seems to me that that's maybe more a question for historians and sociologists and anthropologists than it is insofar as it's a question about causally how certain kinds of social practices take root and how certain kinds of social arrangements um, become dominant. Um, it might be more of a question for, for, for scholars in those fields than for ontologists or philosophers in general, which isn't to kind of draw sharp boundaries, but that's, I guess, to kind of justify why I don't have a really, a really strong answer. I mean, the ways that I think about those historical processes, which um, I find the work of the philosopher Maria Lagona is particularly helpful on this, is she posits a very intimate relationship between um, capitalism and colonialism and those kind of processes of colonization and exploitation and gender. She thinks that, the, that it's, it's, it's kind of wrong to say that there was gender that was then kind of taken and applied to different parts of the world through colonization, but rather that the, those norms and social positions and social relationships that kind of constitute gender were really in a very fundamental sense shaped in and through that those those processes which obviously have a kind of international dimension they are heavily racialized processes and obviously have a very strong economic dimension um i'd be reluctant to say that the, the economy is kind of always in the economic factors are always in the driving street in a really strong sense but they certainly to me seem to be very much in there and um, so that's our way i think about it but that's not to kind of properly answer the question i'm afraid maybe kate i don't know would you want to, to add anything? yeah i think that's um what you're pointing to there is the same sorts of things I was thinking about, sort of ways in which um, economic factors and colonization and patriarchy have sort of fit together. So I think especially if you're thinking, well, look at how many societies are patriarchal versus matriarchal, um, that mm -hmm. might seem surprising if these were sort of, um, uh, if these systems were put in place sort of in particular societies. Of course, we know, you know there's lots of interaction between people across the, across the globe now um, both in terms of things like colonization, as well as in terms of things like information being shared. So it wouldn't be that surprising that sort of things would have shifted in one direction or, or the other sort of regardless, but I do think sort of that these features are connected up to um, systems of dominance and oppression. And that's a way to at least partially explain um, why it is that, uh, yeah, why it is that patriarchy say has sort of spread almost all over the across all almost all societies, um, but again, yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of historical sort of causal explanations that um, I don't uh, know and think are super interesting questions, but are outside my at least current domain of um, knowledge. Yeah, I guess trying to build on that to thinking about like what then is the what then do you and me as ontologists, Kate, like what do we bring to the table? I guess I was thinking, I guess for for me, our job is like if you. If you tell me like the ontological questions are like if we all agree on what the social practices look like and what was going on and kind of empirically in the society, the question like okay so was that gender. Is, is I think a really kind of ontological kind of is a question where you know the ontologists really, really should be kind of contributing to that so Maria Lagones, for example, and others have talked about kind of pre colonial societies or non like non colonized societies now colonized societies that, that before that happened. Um, where there were social practices to do with categorizing people and it seemed to have something to do with reproduction, but some people, at least some theorists have argued that that wasn't gender, it didn't have the right kind of norms or the right kind of coercive structure or something, right. that wasn't gender. And, and then, you know, gender was created through that process of colonization. I think that's an ontological question because you could agree about what was going on in the society, but to know like whether there was gender there or not, then you have to kind of have a theory of, what gender is and that's where it comes in, I guess. Yeah, right, yeah, great point, I totally agree. Okay, so there's two questions that I've sort of noted and I'll put one to Kate and one to Catherine. So Sharon Cohen asks, I wonder if either Kate or Catherine could say something about where the main disagreements are in relation to gender and ontology in philosophy at the moment and what they think about those disagreements. Catherine, do you wanna take that one on? I think that there are a lot of kind of really interesting kind of theories um, being put forward. So, you know, interesting kind of, I think we're really seeing um, 
social ontology of gender kind of become much more joined up. So there was a lot of work on in kind of feminist theory on gender and then some work on social ontology, like what is money? What are lawyers? How does that all exist? And it wasn't always very joined up. And I think what's really exciting to be working now is that you're seeing it kind of joined up. So some debates around that are about whether like the proper role of social structure in thinking about something like gender. So it, are genders like best thought of as like positions in a social structure, which have, you, you've argued Kate and other people have, um, are they best thought of as social statuses, um, those kinds of things. Um, and also there are kind of specific questions about the role of things like self-identification in defining those kind of gender categories. And I think that leads on to some kind of meta conversations about what we're doing when we theorize gender, to what extent are we trying to describe the world as it is, to what extent are we trying to create tools that might lead us in a, you know, towards a world that we'd prefer to live in, say, um, and, and, and these questions about um, ameliorative inquiry, like exactly what it is and how it works and how would you know if it had been successful? So there's kind of base level questions and then kind of quite a lot of sort of negotiation about like the meta, um, the meta philosophy of the area. Okay, so there's a question from Karis Roberts, which I'll put to Kate, because it kind of extends on some of the themes that Catherine was just discussing. How do you think that your approach to the ontology of gender can be of benefit to the broader feminist movement and help to potentially solve some of the difficulties that women face today? Yeah, so I think the role that um, ontology or um, sort of social metaphysics can play in trying to mitigate oppression is sort of, comp yes, let's see. So I think that one way in which I think ontology and metaphysics can be helpful in working to mitigate oppression is through allowing us to better understand um, the nature of different sorts of social categories, what put them in place, um, how they should be understood, how they relate to norms or self-identification, like some of the things Catherine was just bringing out, how they might relate to different power differentials. Because um, I'm inclined to think that if we're trying to figure out how to make things better, we need to sort of start, and I think Catherine thinks this, this as well, we need to start by trying to figure out sort of where we are now, and then we can sort of uh, figure out what tools we're going to need to use to move forward. Um, and I think this is one thing that um, Sally Haslinger makes up a point that she makes really well in her paper on race and gender from 2000, where she says, um, you know, I think she she takes the definition she's giving of race and gender, which involves sort of subordination or privilege, to be useful. And one you know one can argue with her particular views, but to be useful because they're showing how these are tied to like the nature of these categories are tied to oppression or power or subordination and privilege. Um, so I think that can be helpful. But I also think that there's you know I mean there's a limited role that metaphysics or ontology can play in. In making the world a better place and making the world a more just place a lot of work needs to be done on the ground a lot of work needs to be done that just you know is definitely going to be outside of any um academic or other philosophical papers or monographs so i think it has a role but i think the role is constrained certainly okay so this is a um a broader question from Jana Bacevic. She, um, she asks, is vegan a social kind? And if yet, if yes, how is it different from herbivore in brackets if we assume the latter is a natural kind, which it isn't necessarily? So Catherine's nodding. So why don't you um, take up Jana's question? I think it's a really interesting question. I think vegan is a social kind. And I think that the relationship to herbivore is a really interesting way of, of looking at it because what you might say is that you, what you, you might tell a story where you're like, okay, so maybe there, there maybe have always been people who, who don't, who, who, who are herbivores. Um, but when it becomes kind of laden with meaning in a social context, when it kind of relates you to other people, and maybe there's a society or a magazine you subscribe to or people that you swap recipe tips with, and it becomes a part of um, what it, how people respond to you in your situation, how that links you to other aspects of your society in a structural way, um, then, then I think that's when it stops just being like a, a, a fact about you that might be like you're a herbivore and it starts to become like a social kind that we can use to explain the dynamics of how that all then proceeds. Somebody might, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know, not invite you to dinner because you're a vegan, you know, that, that, that's something, I don't know, that's a negative example. I'm sure there are lots of positive examples as well, but like, it might be something that we could use to explain why something happened 
right in 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 a social situation in a way that herbivore was kind of a word that we used before you know that rich kind of network of meaning kind of got going of course when now we're back at language and it might be that that distinction isn't um you know doesn't hold up when we start to probe the language but i would say that when we feel like there's often when we feel like there's like two words that sort of pick out the same thing but one of them's kind of more thin and less social and one of them more points us towards social often that's what's what's going on one of them is directing us more in my view to those kind of networks of social relationships and the social meaning that that feature has kind of acquired in that context. Yeah. Can I jump in on this real quick too? Yeah, so I think that's a super interesting question. I guess I'm in some ways inclined to think that vegan might be, and I mean, of course it can be appealed to in explanations that would involve sort of, yeah, whether someone's invited to dinner or whether someone spends a lot of time on some blog or some other blog. But I think at least there, there's at least one sense I think in which vegan might not be a social kind but then the, the sorts of cases that were making me think maybe that's not right because i mean it seems like you might think of well vegans are um are people who don't um you know don't consume products produced by non-human animals um and i guess the one thing i was thinking of it would really need to be defined i think in terms of non-human animals because mm -hmm. if a vegan doesn't eat honey but then they will of course eat foods produced by other people, like, so it can't be like it's just foods not produced by um, animals. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think this is a good case. And so it might be a case where I think I agree in some sense that there's a, a social meaning and then there's another meaning of the expression that maybe could be given in non-social terms. It might depend what you want to do with it, right? Like if you want to find out about like heart disease or rates or something like that, then maybe you 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 want to, you know, maybe it's not the social kind that you want. Maybe it's something more just about the, the bare fact that people are putting certain kinds of things in their bodies and not others. But then again, once you start, which makes me think it might, I see the pull of thinking it's natural. But then when you think about like social demographics and like other factors kind of mixed in with that, that makes me go more towards the social. Right, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too. Okay, so we've only got a few minutes left and there's definitely a few more questions that I'd like to get through. So we can enter a sort of a quick fire round, so to speak. This question from Rachel Cooper seems ready-made for Catherine. She asks, I wonder if it is right that it is never an ontic injustice to be placed into the category man. Obviously, we are concerned to make clear that men are privileged in the existing social structure, but aren't the norms put on men also harmful? So do you want to say a few things to Rachel on that? Yeah, really quickly. Uh, yes, I actually think that gender like limits everybody and constrains everybody in ways that are unjust and wrongful. And I think that actually being placed into the category of man is an ontic injustice. In my work, I distinguish between ontic injustice, which includes that case, and ontic oppression, where the, the wrongfulness has to be a little bit more systematic um, and rise to a different kind of scale. And I'd want to say that um, for somebody who has a male gender identity or, or doesn't identify differently, being socially constructed as a man is an ontic injustice. Um, but it probably doesn't rise to the level of ontic oppression in, in my view as I draw that distinction. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. And that was a great quick fire answer. So um, a question from Liam Gorner to Kate. Do you think that the natural progression is living in a gender free world or should we embrace gender? Is, is it ever possible to truly live in a gender free society? Um, that's, that's a hard question uh, and a good one. I think we are moving to, well, I think we are moving towards a society that involves more gender possibilities. And I think that is, um, I think that's good that more people, you know, that, that people are um, becoming more able to live uh, with various different gender identities. Not that that's not very challenging still. Will we move towards, or should we move towards um, a gender-free society? I'm not sure actually what I think about that. I think there are certainly aspects of gender, and if you if you think of gender, especially in terms of um, on you know in terms of subordination, I think we should move towards a world without subordination because subordination is wrong. But I think if you do think of um, gender in a more pluralist way um, that involves self identification, I think there are very positive and um, you know, aspects of gender that are positive and really central to how people live their lives and that we might want in a society in the future. So I'm not sure that, I think we should move towards a world without gender in 
in some sense without gender in terms of power and subordination um, and oppression. But I think, yeah, we might actually want some categories that are at least related. And I guess this comes back to how much change is too much change. Is this something completely different now? But we might end up having a world that still has something that people call gender. And that might actually be a, a positive. OK, so there's a question from Lottie Pike. Um, she asked, do you have any book recommendations on the subject of gender ontology? So I've tried to post as many links as possible. I know Catherine earlier entered a book called The Categories We Live By, which you've reviewed. And that's obviously a, I mean, do you have any further things? Perhaps you could post a couple to the chat function, because I'll leave it open for about 10 minutes after the end of the event if you want to answer a couple more questions we haven't been able to or just post a couple of links but do either of you have any um or any of the audience members obviously if, if you have any thoughts for Lottie on this question yeah that's definitely one I'd have mentioned Kate was there is if you had to mention one like what would your um yeah I think I mean I think yeah Asta's book is um good and clear and not too long too which is uh, nice um, I mean, Sally Haslinger's book, Resisting Reality, is more like a book of essays, but that's a classic. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I say that there's a lot in the thing, and certainly you've mentioned a lot of people throughout the event, Maria Lugones, Sa Sally Haslinger, and yeah. lots of others. So hopefully um, a trawl through the chat function can provide some answers and maybe Catherine and Kate could post a couple of other things. So sorry to the enormous number of people whose excellent questions were not answered. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, it's not a long session, just an hour. So thank you so much to both of you for a really great session, great conversation, lovely answers to questions and to um, the audience for, you know, turning up and for your really great questions. Um, the series returns on Monday, a week today at the same time, seven o'clock in the UK, two o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I think EST stands for, and then 11 o'clock Kate's time in California. So it's um, Tommy Curry, who's a professor of philosophy at Edinburgh University, speaking with David Livingston Smith, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of New England. And they're gonna be talking about philosophy after racism. So I'm just going to quickly um, put a link to that in the chat function. And then once we end the event, I'll put up a slide. So um, I'd like to end by thanking Kate and Catherine again. That was a really great hour. And I really appreciate the effort you put into it. So thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, thanks for having us. And thanks for all the great questions. This was really fun.